elevated protein intake mm-hmm. to retain muscle mass. Yeah. Because muscle mass is mm-hmm. something that's been significantly demonstrated to improve yeah. longevity yeah. longevity, and even potentially be protective against cognitive decline and dementia. Which makes sense. Is there a right. thread there of increasing protein intake? Does that help us retain some muscle mass or no? So uh, I, I, this is a really good question. I think it's really interesting because it depends what we're talking about. Are we talking about what I would call cosmetic muscle mass, where it's like I've pumped up and I'm looking right. great and I'm in that like whatever three percent of people that have visible abs, mm. or are we talking about musculoskeletal mass that means I can get up from my bed by my sa- right. myself age eighty four? Right. So the evidence for the cosmetic muscle mass is that it it takes quite a lot to keep it pumped up. Mm-hmm. You can't just eat the protein. <laughs> you've got to do the thing Mm -hmm. so you've got to train but there is some evidence that after the age of especially like after the age of 60 um increasing your protein intake but not by a lot to like maybe two grams per pound so like one gram per kilogram can help with retention with uh muscle retention and that's because we become less efficient at absorbing Mm -hmm. protein it's nothing to do with it's just absorption. Like mm-hmm. we get worse at absorbing everything. Right. <laughs> and right. we have to remember that amino acid uptake into muscle cells and other cells is mediated by insulin. We become more insulin resistant with age. So like the, the key in the lock doesn't work so well. So you just, if you have a bit more protein in your diet, it helps. Yeah. But that's later in life. Right. Now, like there's a hot debate about protein intake. It's people get very upset um, and that's fine. But what I see, at least clinically, is that when people fixate on protein intake to be a certain number, it becomes the primary aim of their dietary intake full stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's damaging to what the rest of their dietary pattern looks like. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to note is that when we look at dietary data and population data, no one's protein deficient. How much protein deficiency is there in the US? Yeah, minimal. No idea. How many people are fiber deficient in the US? I've heard you say this before, but I know it's a lot. 95%. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought that much. 95%. 95 is wild. The average adult gets 18 grams a day or less. And that's what we recommend for a four-year-old. The carnivore diet. Yeah. Let's just like say, just say what on. it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think about that? A lot of thoughts. Um, I think it's a really dangerous trend. Yeah. So from the science we have, following a carnivore diet is directly putting people, especially long term. So always exceptions, ketogenic diets for certain health conditions, specifically um, for severe schizophrenia and for epilepsy. epilepsy. You're talking about keto. Yeah, keto. Keto, Ketogenic. Yeah, 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 same, same. It's like, I feel like the carnivore diet is an offspring of the ketogenic diet. diet. Can have um, beneficial impacts for health outcomes, but they're usually short-term interventions. It's Mm. not like, eat like this for five years, right? Right, right. From what we know now, and uh, listen, I'm really open to this changing. This Mm. might, I don't think it will. It might do a 180. In Mm. in 15 years time, we might look back and go, wow, carnivore diet was what we were looking for. I don't think so. But for now... If anyone starts following the carnivore diet, the evidence we have would suggest that they're increasing their risk of colorectal cancer, heart disease, and then less sort of severe, but still pretty not good, constipation, mm-hmm. gut dysbiosis. Mm-hmm. And and then like if we want to have a fifth point, <clears throat> terrible impact on the environment, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? So I don't... I think what's happened here, like with any big like dietary change, which is really like massive, because the carnivore diet means that you cut out most of your diet. So mm-hmm. any big restrictive diet, what often happens that is that it makes people change their eating behaviors. Sounds obvious, but mm-hmm. the key is the change in eating behaviors. It's mm-hmm. not the carnivore. So if you if you change your eating behavior and start like the cabbage soup diet, terrible diet, but why did people do it? Because they changed their eating behaviors. They stopped eating ultra processed foods. They stopped eating sugar. Mm-hmm. They stopped eating like junk foods. Often these diets also make you stop drinking alcohol. Mm-hmm. And so like they felt good for the first two weeks. They're mm-hmm. like, I've lost weight and I'm like, I have more energy and my brain is clearer. And 
It's like, that's not because of the cabbage soup diet mm -hmm. or it's not because of the carnivore diet, mm -hmm. but it's because you've changed your dietary habits mm -hmm. and you've removed the things that weren't serving you and you're really thinking about what you're eating. Mm -hmm. But after the initial phase of like, woo, I feel great, <laughs> like this is amazing. <laughs> Then you start to see, and it's interesting in the carnivore diet world, you see these things where, like support groups almost, where mm. it's like, okay, I haven't pooped for a week. Like, what do I, don't worry, I keep going up your fat and you'll get there. Mm. I was like, what? Oh, yeah. Like people, people, you can see people suffering with yeah, it, yeah. but then they all like, you know, support each other and encourage it. I mean, I made the mistake of posting, posting a, a, a review, a meta-analysis that was published looking at red meat intake and HbA1c level, mm -hmm. which massive meta-analysis clearly showed that excessive consumption of red meat actually negatively impacts HbA1c, it goes wow. up. Mm. Wow. There's lots of reasons for this, lots of theories and things like, one of them is the insulin sensitivity theory where about 10% of adults are um, predicted to have an insulin response to protein. Mm -hmm. So everyone's like, well, you, if you eat protein, you don't, you don't get insulin. That's not true. Like, mm. <laughs> anyway, side note. But when I posted this, the comments, and I wasn't saying, don't like don't do this i was just saying here's the paper mm. this is what it shows mm -hmm. so actually if you're going to eat animal protein you're best off eating oily fish mm. as your primary source oh my lord <laughs> i like opened a can of worms here yeah. and people are very very emotive about it mm. so the carnivore diet for me is like one of these things that's really taken you know people are very passionate and i'm not denying that there might be a handful of people who truly thrive on this by the way because there's always there's always people who are like unusual but even the ones who have are the most staunch carnivore people, mm -hmm. eventually they're like, and I've decided to reintroduce diet, like fruit into my diet mm. because, and they give some reason, like they're going more paleo or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's because really, truly we're not, we didn't evolve to eat like that. Yeah. I just wonder what we do with, you know, the, all the anecdotal reports all yeah. implies that they're overwhelming. Yeah. But certainly there's anecdotal reports of people, you know, improving their autoimmunity, yeah. like you said, improving their energy. Yeah. I don't know if that's that sustainable, right? Yeah. Because certainly maybe in that window that you mentioned, that these things improve. Yeah. And so maybe they come back later. But what do we do with that, with right. people telling us that? Well, uh, first of all, like, I think a lot of them are uh, self-reported. Right. And uh, so a lot of them are short term. So I felt really great. I did this for six months. Or mm. I've never heard someone do it for more than a couple of years and report it, report anything but there was a really interesting study that looked at how switching from a high protein to a high fiber diet what happened to immune system response so the way like high protein protein is essential for our immune system mm -hmm. so i'm not in any way suggesting that there isn't some benefit to eating the foods in a carnivore diet featured in a carnivore diet and i think for certain conditions and in certain times, actually, it could be an intervention that you try. So maybe it's for schizophrenia, maybe if it's for epilepsy, or maybe it is an autoimmune condition. There's quite a lot of that I've seen. Yeah. Um, you know, patients with things like Crohn's flare ups, finding that they follow a carnivore diet and it like completely resolves their symptoms. So I'm not saying, I guess what I'm, I'm, if you think, if you have like a healthcare professional who can support you and, ma and monitor you and you try that because you've tried lots of things that didn't work, mm -hmm. I'm open to that working, but I think it's for the majority of people, the convincing and overwhelming evidence is that the dietary patterns that support health are not carnivore diets. So it depends what we're talking about. And it's the same thing as like protein fixation in general, where people mm. are obsessed with getting ridiculous amounts of protein in yeah. their diet. But it's like, when we look at, okay, what's your, what's your goal? Are you training for a bodybuilding composition and so actually yeah you need to like build a hell of a lot of muscle mm -hmm. and you're training like five hours in the gym we're lifting heavy weights yeah you probably like your protein intake is going to be unusually high mm -hmm. or are you training to lift to like 98 they're two very different things yeah. but a lot of people are doing this one when they're trying to do this one yeah. so like yeah. i had one patient who his trainer had recommended he two grams of protein per kilogram. I can't do the conversion to pounds. It's like 2.2. Is it 2.2? So like four grams of protein per pound ish, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot. This guy was, the reason he was seeing people was because he unfortunately had obesity quite severely. Mm. 
so you're just you're telling a person who is got a very high body weight to try and get four grams of protein per pound why yeah why yeah like this guy was to to get to that yeah. he was eating per protein bars protein shakes then he was having like salmon for breakfast chicken five eggs and every day he struggled to mm -hmm. get to that oh. and he wasn't feeling better surprisingly <laughs> what do you think of um uh elevated protein intake to mm -hmm. retain muscle mass yeah because muscle mass is mm -hmm. something that's been significantly demonstrated to improve yeah. longevity yeah. longevity and even potentially be protective against cognitive decline and dementia which makes sense is there a right. thread there of increasing protein intake does that help us retain some muscle mass or no so I, I, this is a really good question i think it's really interesting because it depends what we're talking about are we talking about what i would call cosmetic muscle mass where it's like i've pumped up and i'm looking right. great and I'm in that like whatever three percent of people that have visible abs, mm. or are we talking about musculoskeletal mass that means I can get up from my bed by my say, myself right. age 84? Right. So the evidence for the cosmetic muscle mass is that it, it takes quite a lot to keep it pumped up. Mm -hmm. You can't just eat the protein; <laughs> you've got to do the thing. Mm -hmm. So you've got to train. But there is some evidence that after the age of, especially like after the age of 60, um, increasing your protein intake but not by a lot to like maybe two grams per pound. So like one gram per kilogram can help with retention, with uh, muscle retention. And that's because we become less efficient at absorbing mm -hmm. protein. It's nothing to do with, it's just absorption. Mm -hmm. Like we get worse at absorbing everything. Right. <laughs> and right. we have to remember that amino acid uptake into muscle cells and other cells is mediated by insulin. We become more insulin resistant with age. So like the, the key in the lock doesn't work so well so you just, if you have a bit more protein in your diet it helps yeah. but that's later in life right. now like there's a hot debate about protein intake it's people get very upset um and that's fine but what i see at least clinically is that when people fixate on protein intake to be a certain number it becomes the primary aim of their dietary intake full stop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's damaging to what their the rest of their dietary pattern looks like mm -hmm. And the other thing to note is that when we look at dietary data and population data, no one's protein deficient. How much protein deficiency is there in the US? Yeah, minimal. No idea. How many people are fiber deficient in the US? I've heard you say this before, but I know it's a lot. 95%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have thought that much. 95. 95 is percent. wild. The average adult gets 18 grams a day or less. And that's what we recommend for a four-year-old. Wow. So why are we, so when we look at protein intake without supplementation, tends to be nearly twice what people need already, just mm -hmm. from food. Because everything has protein in it, pretty mm -hmm. much apart from butter, like certain food. So everything has protein in it. We eat a lot of food, generally, that we eat more food than we need. Mm -hmm. So guess what? We're getting more protein mm -hmm. than we need. <laughs> but then what happens is we then fixate on like just getting protein and we fixate on high protein foods. And we, we don't stop to, when we're doing like our protein calculations in the apps, we don't stop to add in the protein okay. from mm. the vegetables and the nuts. Like we're, we're just like, here's how much chicken I had. Here's how yeah. much salmon I had. Here's like my protein shake. Mm -hmm. And so like the whole protein thing is, is very weird to me because the evidence we have from longevity data and from data that we do trials in older people. So like some really nice science that, you can decrease frailty, increase cognitive function. Mm. And guess what dietary intervention will use for that? Mediterranean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and guess what Mediterranean diet isn't? High, High protein. protein. High protein or carnivore yeah. diet. So like, for me, it's, it's not a mystery. We have plenty of data that shows us which dietary patterns. It's not just, you know, portfolio diet has some good research, mm -hmm. DASH diet. Mm -hmm. Med is my favorite, but... There's good evidence to show like what kind of diet mm -hmm. helps people to live long independently yeah. with good cognitive function. Mm -hmm. So why are we trying to unpick that and create falsehoods about, yeah. oh, well, we're not getting enough protein. And it, the only time you see protein deficiency, I will say this, is people who don't eat enough food. Mm -hmm. So we have to remember we also live in a culture where food is now feared. People are scared of eating because mm -hmm. they just don't know what they're supposed to be eating. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes people will like supplement and they'll really reduce, re restrict their food intake. Mm -hmm. 
Now they're maybe at risk because actually you're not eating enough food <laughs> to to thrive. Yeah. And then the other the other groups that are at risk of protein deficiency, and it's this is going back to the fact that our immune system is a protein loving system, are people who have uh, undergone chemotherapy and have cancer because cancer is an incredibly yeah. immune intense activity. Yeah. So actually cancer patients, and this is why cancer, like cancer dietitians are so important. The, the, the likelihood of survival is strongly linked to your muscle mass when you start treatment. And that's because literally during treatment and like during cancer, your body uses your muscle as, actually, yeah. as like source for protein. That's interesting. And then the other time where we have increased need for protein is pregnancy because we're building a person and an extra <laughs> organ to host the person. Mm -hmm. But the evidence shows that supplementing with protein in pregnancy is harmful. Hmm. So if you take protein supplements in pregnancy, you're more likely to have intrauterine growth restriction, mm. which doesn't make sense, but biology is smarter than we are. So just eat the food, <laughs> <laughs> right? So those are the two, like there's, there's, there are times in life when, and listen, one in two people get cancer. Mm -hmm. So is it useful for people to understand that their muscle mass and their like musculoskeletal mass is really important. Body composition is really important before you enter treatment. So like yeah. prehab is critical. That's important to know. Yeah. But other than these times, like just maintaining good musculoskeletal mass because you're moving functionally, you're actually leaving your desk to go for a walk for 20 minutes. You're going to the gym or you're bending down. Well, I don't mind, I, I don't, how people move is up to them. Mm -hmm. But just eating the protein isn't going to give you the musculoskeletal mass. Sure. Mm. You've got to eat food. You'll get enough protein from that and then move your body yeah. to actually create the body that's going to sustain you for life, right? Yeah. 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 